Uh, good afternoon, gentlemen. Welcome to our session. Uh, new norm, new concept, and new engines. This is a very exciting topic. And also, we have also very exciting uh, panelists here. And uh, let me first introduce them, and then we directly jump into the topic, right? Uh, to my left, we have uh, Mr. Lei Jun, who is a founder of uh, several very exciting companies, uh, starting from uh, Zhuo Yue. Uh, Zhuo Yue, uh, what's, the, what's the English name? Zhuo Yue. Uh, Zhuo Yue. Zhuo Yue. Zhuo Yue to uh, Xiaomi, which is a high profile, innovative uh, landmark company in today's China. And uh, to his uh, uh, left, we have our distinguished um, minister, uh, uh, Chairman Xu Shaoshi, who is the chairman of the NDRC. Everybody should know NDRC. If you don't know, I'm sorry. I don't want to introduce the NDRC, OK? <laughs> and then to his left, we have um, uh, a gentleman from all the way from continental Europe. We feel very close to get guests from continental Europe to the nowadays, right? His name is Faika uh, Sibisma. He is the CEO of uh, DSM. And I will ask him to introduce DSM later on. So I will have some suspense here, OK? And to his left, we have actually our local host, our local host, vice mayor of Tianjin, the city of Tianjin, a new champion, right? Vice Chairman of Tianjin, and uh, he, uh, Mr. Yan Qingming, who used to be a Deputy Chairman of China's Banking Regulatory Commission. And then to his, uh, to his left, we have Hugh Martin, uh, CEO of uh, Sensity Systems in the USA. He has been a CEO of multiple innovative companies. Um, without further ado, let me first ask uh, Mr. Chairman, Xu uh, Shi, may I speak to Chinese? Uh, just, uh, just to make sure I, the message is clearly conveyed. Okay, uh, not that I don't trust the translators, but you know it's better this way. Okay, Xu Xu Zhuo, now. So, Mr. Xu, so may I start from you? I know you have been working very hard. You have just participated in the. Uh, China-Russian uh, head of state uh, negotiations. So I understand that uh, you have just accompanied the uh, chairman of China, uh, PRC. You went to uh, uh, Serbia uh, and several other two countries. And also, you have participated in the uh, Shanghai Council uh, meeting. So just to talk to me about the uh, One Belt, One Road. I believe that. Um, your trip has um, made a lot of pro promotions to the One Belt, One Road. So let me talk about this. Yeah, just um, as an introduction. So stand, uh, thank you for the moderator. Ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon. Uh, like what has been said by uh, the moderator, I have just accompanied Mr. Xi Jinping. We went to visit um, uh, Poland, Serbia, and um, the other country, and also participate in the uh, summit of the uh, Shanghai Cooperation uh, Organization, and also participate in the um, summit meeting between China, Russia, and uh, Mongolia. We also believe that, uh, as promoted by the Chairman Xi, in 2013, One Belt, One Road, and uh, we went to the uh, uh, Uzbekistan. So about three years has gone. We actually have um, summarized the uh, uh, work over the last three years, and also we have discussed how we can further work on the One Belt, One Road. I believe that uh, we have achieved a lot of uh, good um, results and achievements, and also I can share with you some of the uh, results we have uh, achieved. I believe that for this uh, forum, I believe that you are paying great attention on the Chinese economy, foreign friends and domestic friends. I believe that um, you have every reason to pay attention on that. So till last year, the uh, total economic volume uh, account for about 14% of the global total. The 
Chinese economic growth has now contributed to 25% of the global total. And therefore, everybody is paying attention to the Chinese economy. I believe that um, the Chinese economy actually should have a new perspective, and we have a very good uh, judgment. The Chinese economy has entered the new normal. As we all know that uh, the new normal has uh, three major changes. One is the uh, growth rate. Second is the uh, optimal optimization of the structure. And third is the uh, change of the uh, drivers. I believe that from these three perspectives, I believe that the Chinese economy is developing very healthily. So to summarize with three uh, eight characters, we have a very stable economic growth, and uh, we are ha having pretty good growth. And now we have the 6.7% of GDP growth, the CPI. Now is 2.3%. Uh, the employment is uh, about 3.18 million. So the growth rate is now between 5 to 7. So I believe that uh, although the growth rate has changed, but still is within the uh, reasonable uh, rate. And also the uh, optimization of uh, structure, we can summarize that with uh, two sentences. One is that uh, the tertiary industry is uh, exceeding the uh, second uh, uh, industry. The service um, industry has now exceeded in the uh, manufacturing industry. The contribution to the economy, the consumption has now exceeded uh, investment. The optimization of structure should also be mentioned that the uh, uh, structure between rural and uh, city areas and also the uh, regional uh, structure. I believe that now we believe that uh, for the uh, northeast, now in the uh, we have now uh, several new challenges in terms of the uh, uh, de uh, capacity. I believe that uh, for the uh, east and also for the south, now we have a pretty good economic growth, and also for the uh, rural areas, the urbanization has now exceeded five, uh, fifty-one point uh, fifty-five. 0.1%, and also for the change of driver, we have the uh, new models and new business uh, uh, industries, and now are developing. We have the uh, everybody is uh, engaged in the innovation. Now ha it has become a trend. The new drivers, although still not enough to substitute in the uh, old drivers, but now they are in, uh, enjoying very good uh, growth. I believe that uh, we have the uh, optimization of structure as well as the uh, change of drivers. So from this perspective, I believe that the Chinese economy is pretty healthy and uh, stable and sustainable. In order to maintain the momentum, we certainly will further continue the uh, structural reform. We all know that it's the 3D and uh, the uh, one uh, reduction. We need to further uh, reform the structure and also to foster the new drivers and uh, growth uh, sources. And we also need to foster the new growth uh, sources. That's the uh, four news. With the policy, with the uh, fostering of markets, we need to support the new technology, new business model, new business, uh, uh, new industries. At the same time, for the uh, traditional industries, should be joined with the um, information technology so that they can have a better transformation, so that we can have a better change of drivers. And so we need to deepen reform and uh, further open to the open, open, open to the outside world, and need to. A streamline in the streamline the government and also to foster the organic growth of the economy and also we need to open more to the outside world and establish the new scheme and the systems and we have a lot of foreign friends here for the uh, 
guidelines of the uh, uh, foreign investors, and now we have increased the new categories, uh, and also we have reduced some of the uh, categories in some areas and regions. Now we have um, from the new pilot programs uh, in terms of the uh, uh, national uh, treatment for the foreign investors. With this guideline, I believe that uh, we can create a better market uh, and uh, and uh, framework environment for the foreign investors. At the same time, the Chinese economy has been integrated into the world economy and will be impacted by the uh, world economy. We all know that uh, the macroeconomic policies and now has great impact, for example, the uh, Brit, uh, Brit exit as well as the, uh, for the volatility of the commodities and also the uh, flow of um, uh, capital certainly will have great impact on China's economy. And as a big economy, we certainly will have some uh, volatility in terms of its operation. This is a pretty normal. What I want to say is that um, for the Chinese economy, I hope that uh, you need to have the confidence uh, we have a very good uh, um, infrastructure, we have a pretty good uh, uh, capital, and also we have a market of 1.3 uh, billion in population. We have uh, more than uh, 900 million workforce, and also we uh, have the total workforce of um, 71 million. Uh, so that's our potential, and that's our room as well as the um, persistence. So you need to have the confidence in the Chinese economy. So with the further expansion of the um, demand, we certainly will deepen the supply side reform to make sure that the Chinese economy will operate within the reasonable um, range. So actually, you will have uh, two very quick questions. And so uh, actually, you have to talk about these two questions. The first one is that um, for the structural uh, reform, probably will result some of the uh, uh, decrease of the growth rates. This is uh, pretty normal. And uh, do we have the uh, lowest limit for the growth rate? Of course, we have the uh, bottom line. So for this year, we have the uh, range between 6.5% to 7%. And therefore, this is a pretty uh, resilient. According to our estimate, within the 13th uh, uh, five-year plan, we need to build the uh, uh, well of society. So for the following five years, the growth rate should not be under 6.5 percent. That's the uh, following five years, the um, bottom line. And the second quick question is that um, the uh, structural reform is uh, pretty difficult and hard. So for the future 35 years, we need to focus on this uh, structural reform. So for this year, according to your estimate, how much we can accomplish in terms of the uh, structural reform or can you give us a quantitative um, uh, indication for the structural reform? It is hard. I know that um, this is a, a pretty whole concept. According to the traditional, uh, uh, aside from the traditional industries uh, transformation, also we need to foster the new business models and new innovation. And also we include the uh, rural industry as well as the integration of uh, first and uh, second industries, uh, as well as the service industry um, uh, upgrade. I understand from your question is that um, what is the important currently is that how we can face the uh, um, the overcapacity, how we can reduce the unnecessary redundant capacity. Uh, so we, know, we all know that. Um, the document uh, number seven and the number six, and the, the council issued these uh, policies, uh, and uh, they're going to reduce uh, the, um, 100 to 150 million tons of the surplus capacity for the coal and also for the steel and the iron. And uh, the others are going to be reduced through the restriction. 
and the reduction of production. And currently, we start to implement all these uh, policies uh, through the negotiation with uh, the 31 uh, provinces, uh, their uh, state-owned enterprises there. And we also defined the assignment for those state-owned enterprises. And this year, we're going to replace uh, 700,000 people. And we're going to reduce uh, 45 million tons uh, in the uh, iron and steel industry uh, by the replacement of uh, um, uh, 180,000 people. So uh, what, what, what's about the progress now? Is it a smooth process? Yes, uh, uh, there are two sentences to describe it. The first, uh, the there is arduous work ahead because uh, the surplus uh, capacity reduced. Uh, it's about uh, the reduction of the debts, the restructuring, and uh, the transformation, and also the industrial uh, layout and design. So I think, as you can imagine, this work is really hard to do. And the sec second sentence is uh, from the central government to the local uh, governments. Uh, we all make a concerted efforts to implement all these policies issued by the state council uh, proactively. I am confident personally that about uh, the, the coal uh, surplus uh, Supply capacity and also the iron and steel surplus capacity is going to be achieved uh, this year. Thank you. Thank you very much. And also, I, I have a further follow up questions for the representatives from the local government, our vice mayor from the Tianjin. And um, are we, the Tianjin hosted tens, uh, ten, 10 of the uh, WEF conferences. What do you think is the most attractive thing to Tianjin City to uh, take the lead uh, in China? Thank you for your question. And uh, Mr. Xu, just to give us uh, the uh, complete description of Chinese economic situation. And uh, well, out of the 10 WEF conferences, uh, uh, Tianjin hosted five out of the 10 um, conferences. and. Uh, with the leadership of the State Council, Tianjin Municipality has drawn up its uh, own orientation paper um, based on uh, the Tianjin, Beijing, and the Hebei Province Integrity Development Plan. So now we are facing um, another industrial revolution. I believe that, basically speaking, the manufacturing industry now in China, especially for the strategic and emerging, like the uh, e uh, electronic and uh, communications, uh, the aerospace, uh, the auto industry, and also the uh, battery industry, including those um, um, a chemical industry. So when it comes to the manufacturing industry, we can see there is a positive trajectory for this industry, even though there is a hardship uh, inside of it. As to how, how we envision the future, I would like to take this opportunity to give you an introduction. And according to the State Council, uh, there is so-called five big opportunities. And one is the integration between Beijing, Tianjin, and Hebei province. And uh, especially when they are in the first year of 13th five years plan period, and how should we grip on these opportunities, and how should we integrate the resources in Tianjin to make contributions to the development of, uh, to the integral development around uh, Beijing area. So as we used to say that uh, in 1980s, we should see the Shenzhen for development of China. And in the 1990s, we should see the Pudong area in Shanghai. Now, as we are in, into the 21st century, uh, we should attract their attention and the people should cast their eyes on this region. When we implement all this development plan for the integral de development of these uh, three, uh, uh, three uh, regions, uh, Beijing, Tianjin, and uh, Hebei uh, province, and also, we can t uh, make reference uh, to uh, the development of Seoul, uh, which is uh, quite uh, similar to the situation in Beijing. And also, we have other uh, successful cases like in US that when 
uh, there is a non-capital functions in Beijing. We can try to remove all those functions to other areas and regions. And during this removal, we should not ignore the education resources. The people are really concerned about their educations of their children. And Tianjin hosts over 50 universities and colleges. And only secondary to Beijing in terms of the education resources. In terms of the medical and health resources, about over 5,000 clinicals and 40 grade three, uh, the top top grade hospitals. And, and Tianjin is only secondary to Beijing and Shanghai in terms of all these medical resources. Plus these two advantages, uh, together with the transportation advantages, Tianjin could stand out in terms of the transportation sector, environmental protection, and also integral, uh, integrated development. So uh, in terms of the national strategy, uh, Tianjin has a lot of opportunity to develop. Um, as to um, the One Belt, One Road initiative and other strategic plans uh, for the Binghai New Region in Tianjin and other kind of uh, central government initiatives uh, they, which provide the enriched opportunities for Tianjin to provide uh, service. And uh, how should we or orient uh, position ourselves to provide service to the central uh, government and to the national planning? Okay. Can you give us uh, uh, examples? What are the most highlighted and focused industries? So besides the uh, industries of national strategic significance, um, like uh, the aerospace industry uh, to build the helicopters here in Tianjin, and uh, also for the space exploration industry, and some out of uh, uh, those uh, aerospace research has been done now in Tianjin. So Tianjin is one integral part for the uh, national strategic uh, uh, layout uh, when it comes to the aerospace uh, industry. And also, to build those small and medium enterprises into bigger and high-tech companies uh, accredited by the Ministry of Science and Technology is another case. And we know there are a lot of uh, scientific and high-tech companies here in Tianjin, but uh, none of them are very famous, are very uh, big skilled. So we need to do more to improve their skill. Either they are engaged in the printing, in the biotechnology, in the medical and the health um, sector, like uh, the uh, and also life science. So we need more incubation for those uh, small and medium uh, enterprises. And of course, uh, they need to respect the environment. They cannot be the polluter. OK, uh, second question. Uh, uh, we, we, as we are all businessmen sitting here in the audience, uh, they are, uh, are more interested in the statistics. And what about uh, the growth rate, 9.3% uh, last year? So how about the first half of this year? For 9.3% uh, for the first quarter. And by the end of the June, um, the second quarter is going to be expected at 9.1%. So what about uh, for the next five years um, in parallel with our 13th five-year plan period? Uh, what's your plan? Well, it is around uh, uh, 6 to 7 percent at the national level. But in Tianjin, it is 9 percent, nine, around 9 percent growth rate. Um, it may be a lower uh, 8 point something percent. And we will be heavily reliant on the high technology and science. Uh, and the modern science, oh, sorry, modern service industry uh, will be the big uh, catalyst for the economic development of uh, Tianjin. As you already know, that we're going to rely on the innovation uh, through uh, leasing. Through the leasing, we're going to support uh, the service industry. And I can share with you the data at the national level by the end of the 2015. The financing and the financial leasing to get all together uh, has achieved uh, uh, 1 billion RMB. And the 10 percent comes out of uh, Tianjin. And the ten, another 10 percent uh, um, 
in terms of uh, the companies registered. So in the last uh, one decade, in the looking ahead into the five year, um, we are going to suppose all this uh, service industry to go out of uh, Tianjin. Well, another thing that we are very interested in that uh, have you considered uh, the improvement of air quality in the 13th five year problem? I'm not complaining about the air quality. I am quite satisfied with today's uh, blue sky. Well, in the next five years, the PM 2.5 uh, indicator. Uh, has been planned that we're going to reduce by 16.7 percent, uh, and uh, there is going to be monitored by the Ministry of uh, uh, Environment. Uh, we have drawn up a series of measures in, besides the inventory uh, reform, for example, the supply of the coal, and uh, we're going to finish the reform of the inventory of the coal by the end of this year, and we're going to uh, remove uh, the part of the communities that burn coal a lot by the end of this industry. Okay, th uh, th thank you. Thank you. I would like to uh, Ask another question to our Chinese uh, entrepreneur Lei Jun, um, who co-founded a high-tech uh, company Xiaomi. So, in this new round of uh, entrepreneurship, how do you feel about this environment for entrepreneurship compared with 20 years ago? Or do you think there is any weak points that you want to complain um, to our government officials sitting there together, uh, sitting here with you? So generally speaking, we can see there is a um, overturn on um, change uh, when it comes to the uh, entrepreneurship. I'm not uh, flattering them when they are sitting here. Actually, where are the changes? A series of uh, policies, especially a series of uh, new incubators, uh, including the public opinion environment, have all been changed in the past 20 years. And we have seen uh, more and more innovative companies emerge, including the uh, ubiquitous uh, 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 application of uh, internet. And some people sitting at home can, uh, can provide the business throughout the world. Uh, compared with what I did in uh, 15 years ago and 25 years ago, um, the environment has been approved a lot, but there's still a lot of hardships and difficulties compared with the Silicon Valley in the United States. And uh, now the major focus for us is in the PE. I mean the investment and the real uh, money put in uh, the uh, venture area, a venture period is less. So it takes a company startup uh, 10 years at most or six to seven years at least um, to, to get bigger and to get their uh, investment. So it's really hard for the money to flow to the early period to, to, to support those startups. So it still takes a longer time for them. I believe you must uh, you, uh, do some venture capitals to invest in some new uh, startups. So just uh, put away your, your marketing desire. Can you just uh, uh, give us an introduction? Well, I have invested in a lot of uh, startups in, after the 2007 um, when I uh, put the T3 software publicly listed. And I have tried to do something in this regard. We focused on, uh, we communicated with a lot of uh, government officials. Uh, it is really not a solution to get loans from the banks for those startups. And the startups can only get uh, the opportunities from the NGO round uh, investment. And uh, then we started to practice the NGO uh, investment. Uh, for the past 10 years, we have achieved a lot regarding the NGO uh, investment. It's so it's uh, pretty like the uh, lottery. 
and uh, I believe that uh, when you invest, most of the investment won't have the return. So the, for the Android investment, the core is that uh, it's uh, pretty like the uh, crowdfunding, and you support the startups, and uh, most of them won't be successful. So if one of the uh, one of the investment is being successful, I believe that uh, you have. Uh, uh, Unexpected investment, and for the investment for the um, Google or Facebook, you can earn about uh, 1,000 times of uh, return. So, is it uh, okay for you to talk about it? And so, uh, in 07, I invested in the UC Web. That is the um, um, the, the the browser uh, for your uh, smartphone, and uh, invested about about uh, 40, uh, 20 percent. And uh, last year it was uh, acquired by Alibaba at the rate uh, the uh, price of uh, four point three billion. So I don't quite understand that uh, why Android investment is still lacking. I believe that. Um, Indeed, uh, many of the entrepreneurs here in China, when they have enough money, and uh, of course, uh, people encouraged to reinvest, and uh, they have the ex experience, and uh, they can help uh, young people not to take the day, day tours. And uh, I can invest about two million RMB, and uh, can help you avoid the day tour. So we now have the encouragement, and now you, you invest uh, again, and uh, you can have about the thirty percent of um, a return. Of course, the reason you mentioned is one of the reasons. Of, I believe that the angel investment could be only uh, successful. When you invest about 30, uh, 30 startups, and uh, I believe that uh, indeed the uh, investment won't be that um, a good um, a business. So we hope that the taxation should be uh, counted within seven years, and um, that is um, uh, how much loss I made within the last seven years should be uh, deducted. And also, we have a lot of. Uh, uh, media coverage about uh, my angel investment, and it depends on how much, uh, how many successful startups you have invested. Of course, uh, this is indeed a great uh, requirement for the taxation system. So, for Mr. Xu, can you make this a commitment? Indeed, this will be a great uh, reform in terms of the uh, taxation system. So, for the local government, can you make the commitment again to uh, have the reform? Indeed, we have now the uh, taxation uh, reform from the uh, operating tax to the uh, value-added tax. So now let's uh, listen to the entrepreneurs from U.S., from Europe, and to listen to their ex experience. So I certainly will um, speak in Mandarin and be translated with the uh, interpreters. So from FICA, very simple question for the first one. Can you tell briefly to us what the uh, most uh, the products you are most uh, proud of from DSM? <coughs> Appreciate uh, to be here. And sorry not to speak Chinese, but uh, <laughs> I hope the translation is correct. Um, our company started more than 115 years ago as uh, in a business that you might well relate to, coal mining. And after 40, 50 years in the coal mining, we thought maybe that has not the full future. And we changed our company from a coal mining company towards a chemical company. And we used the coax gas coming out of coal uh, for switching our company to uh, a chemical company. And by the way, that was a very good decision just on time in the 50s, because 10 years after we made that switch, gas was found in the northern part of the Netherlands, and our coal mines were gradually closed. But fortunately, the company not. It transformed. OK. In the 90s, in the last 10 years, we made again a second transformation. We stopped and we divested all our bulk chemical business and we changed again into a life sciences and material science business we are today. 
We are the largest food ingredient and feed ingredient manufacturer in the world, providing ingredients for food and feed. And we are one of the larger material science companies in the world, providing materials, clean materials, for electronics, for cars, making them lighter, for panels for solar and, and biofuels. So we transformed the company twice. Yeah. Uh, <coughs> So can I uh, say this, and that's uh, actually your company is actually the uh, biggest vitamin material supplier uh, of the world. Is that correct? The vitamin, vitamin, yes. So before that, you, a company was engaged in the coal mining, and now you are producing the uh, vitamin and also the uh, LED from the uh, black products to the white products. So as uh, so an old friend, uh, actually, in the past, you are a state-owned company. Now you are a public company. So my, comp my question is that uh, how can you transform the uh, state-owned company producing coal, uh, uh, coal, and now you have been transformed to the uh, production of the uh, new products? Can you tell your experience? Of course, uh, it's not a secret. And, um, <laughs> yeah, absolutely willing to share that in China. And we just discussed with my colleague here, who led some startup companies. And it is different, I tell you, to invest and to start a new company than to transform an existing company. And I think this might be the challenge for China also, to transform from something you have built, something existing. I don't want to call that the startup of China as a whole, but still, China built something from almost nothing, which is fabulous. And now comes to the question of a transformation. Why did we transform our company? Because we believe in Darwin. I'm a biologist, and only those who will survive in this world, those who do adapt. The world around changes, and if you don't adapt, you will not survive. And out of a competitive reason, we did not want to have our Kodak moment. Mm. Our Kodak moment means to be very good in something which is not needed anymore. Mm. And we did not want to have that Kodak moment, and therefore we wanted to invest in so-called sunrise businesses and not in sunset businesses. Mm. And therefore we changed and transformed twice our company. What that needs is a total analysis of the world around, how that changes, and how you can divest the part of your business and acquire a new business. Okay, it needs analysis, it needs guts, and so far it looks easy. The more difficult part is the leadership, your competences, the culture, because you are changing something which you are, were used to do for decades, uh, something you were good at, so you need to add new competences. You need to add maybe changes in leadership. You need to change your culture. If you come from a coal mining strict manufacturing philosophy to a more innovative company like we are today, you need a different culture. You need maybe to have more open innovation. You need more different behaviors. Mm -hmm. And I find that the challenge of our company. And to be honest, therefore I'm so excited about China. Because China, and I see it with the chairman of the NDSC, indicating it also clearly, the changes that China is undergoing right now are to a certain degree a comparable, much more complicated than our small company, of course. But in total, there are some similarities, also in the type of business we are talking, from coal mining to life sciences materials, from purely manufacturing also to innovation. And China went through different phases, from the opening in China when Deng Xiaoping showed how big the market is, towards manufacturing, towards maybe in the third phase even inviting others to manufacture in China, and now in the fourth phase of its development into innovation, service economy, uh, global brands, etc. And I think the big challenge is and, and, and how can you make that transformation? And I found it easier, and I think Premier Li Keqiang also said it one time, so I dare to mention that also then, uh, is that it is easier to add competences from almost nothing 
than to change your competences if you've built a strong strength. Mm. So the challenge, like it was for us, also for China, I think are great. The mm. good thing I see is that China and the Chinese leadership realizes this fully. And the one road, one belt approach, also more open innovation, uh, an, an open approach, not alone, but throughout this whole belt, this whole road, I think fully fits, according to me, in that model. And some people ask to me, are you negative on the growth in China? China's slowing down. Why are you investing still so much in China? And, and the arguments are used, exactly the same arguments as the chairman of the NDOC is using, so I feel very comfortable sitting here. Because I say, China, the fundamentals are very good in China. I mean, it's a big market, and the middle class is developing, the urbanization is there, the money capital is there, the infrastructure. And compare China with some other Asian countries, the infrastructure in China is there, the technical expertise for more than two million technical people from university is there. So a lot of the fundamentals are there. Now, that provides a great future. If China can deal with this complicated challenge, and I think that is complicated, to transform itself from manufacturing only towards manufacturing plus innovation, global brands, service economy. It's easier said than done, but with a lot of guts and a lot of leadership, as we have shown in a very small case, only one company, I think it is possible to do that. And therefore, I feel so excited about China, David. Thank you very much um, for your words. I believe that um, uh, many of the uh, contributions have been made by the foreign investors like uh, 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 FICA. So, uh, of course, you are the uh, uh, tutor of the uh, Chinese um, um, uh, uh, enterprises. So, we now ask uh, Hugh Martin, indeed, actually, you have been a CEO in many of the startups and innovative uh, businesses. So, can you talk briefly that um, which product or which service uh, you are most proud of? You know, uh, we started uh, four years ago at this company, Sensity Systems, and our mission is to improve the quality of life for citizens of cities. That's our job. And uh, our, our driver is what Mayor Bloomberg of New York City once said, which is, if you can't manage what's, if you can't measure what's going on in your city in real time, you can't manage it. So. We've developed a, a system of sensors and uh, software with hundreds of applications that allow you to understand what's going on in the city and then to effect change. So we have uh, partnerships with General Electric and Cisco and Acuity Brands and, and Panasonic, and we have installations in Kansas City and Chicago and Adelaide, Australia and Dubai. Uh, but uh, the, the question for me, the critical question was, okay, well, how, what can we do about China? Because you know, there are a few problems with quality of life in, in cities in China. And uh, th we thought really hard about how we could do this. Uh, last year, I was on the presidential trade mission with Secretary Penny Pritzker and met with uh, many officials in China, including uh, the premier and the vice premier. And they said to me two things that I heard really well. One is, we're going to focus on rule of law and IPR. And two, we're going to focus on infrastructure. And uh, so infrastructure is exactly what we do. So the question, though, for us in China is that what we do is very, very sensitive. So we are gathering millions of pieces of information about what goes on in every city, all these cities. And so uh, to do that, for a U.S. company to do that in China would be practically impo is impossible. Mm -hmm. So how can we, from a security point of view, create the technology for China uh, that would be very successful here. And so we've worked on this for the last six months and last month announced uh, a partnership with the Chinese Academy of Sciences. So we have created a joint venture and this joint venture uh, is located in Guangzhou and we are contributing all of our intellectual property and the Chinese Academy of Sciences intellectual property to develop a new platform for smart cities uh, and qual improving quality of life that uh, is unique in that it is, we think it's the best in the world, but also is it's compatible 
in a software way with everything in the rest of the world. So now there's a huge market for Chinese software developers, as well as increasing the quality of life in China. So uh, we're very, very excited about China. And, and this, this business model, I think, is very innovative in that our, our return on this investment will because, be because we own half of a Chinese company. Can I summarize this way that one of the out of this uh, pro products is that uh, your products is going to uh, get the impulse of the cities, that you can get all this information about the cities uh, like a sensor of a city. So in Chinese market, in the next 10 years, if it develops uh, smoothly, will it become the biggest uh, market for you? It is by far the largest market. So uh, in the US, I, I don't know the, spe the um, details here, but in the US, 30% of the hydrocarbon emissions in a city during the day are from automobiles either looking for parking or because of congestion. And with sensors, you can understand much better how to manage traffic and how to guide citizens to parking. And so we see meaningful reductions in hydrocarbon emissions. So we know that now in, in, in Beijing is going to charge the congestion fee. So will your device help the government to charge uh, the congestion fee? <laughs> um, it could make it a little more difficult. Uh, but just another specification. So the largest lit city, so where we put these sensors is we put them in streetlights. Uh, the largest lit city in the United States is Chicago. Chicago has 375,000 streetlights. Mm. Shanghai has 1.9 million streetlights. So the market here is enormous, and I think the opportunity is terrific. And um, you know, I, when I started this whole project, I, I talked to a good friend of mine. His name is Mike, Michael Moritz. He's the chairman of Sequoia Venture Capital. And I said, how can we build a business in China successfully? And he said, there's two things that are very important to you. The first is find people that you trust and that you can relate to and that you can work really well because while there's this idea that China will somehow destroy your company, the people, if you know them well, are, are very good people. And the second is create a business structure so that everyone wins. If it's all about your company winning, you will be dead. But if you can create a structure that allows both of you to coexist, you could build a huge business. Mm. So can I summarize this way? Your company comes to China. You have your worries. The major worries is not on the micro policy level, like the re-infrastructure. You're worrying about the micro level issues. You need to find the right person, right city. Is that right? Correct. So you need to so for Mr. Shi, you are quite confident with NDRC, right? But you need to be careful with the partners, with the businessmen, right? <laughs> so, so, so in fact, uh, we, we specifically, we talked to uh, Huawei, we talked to ZTE, we talked to China Telecom and China Mobile, and all of them have their own plans, but it's from their own perspective. And the, we discovered the right partner, Chinese Academy of Sciences, you know, they started Lenovo. Uh, they had the right perspective on the whole problem. And so I think it's going to be a tremendous partnership. Mm. Yes, I have finished all the questions. And now it's the audience to ask the question. So maybe this can take a very good case to communicate with our foreign friends. OK, you, uh, audience, uh, you are encouraged to ask questions. The lady in the front line. Please introduce yourself first. Thank you, moderator. Um, and the, uh, from media, from China Herald of Economy. So I have a question for Mr. Xu. Now, uh, to prevent uh, from the risk is the, the major thing we need to do. I want to know the leverage ratio and uh, what's the risk for the debt. And you once said that we need to be very prudent when it comes to the deleverage. So in the future, what will be your measures to mitigate all the risks during the deleveraging? Thank you for your question. And this is a question of uh, 
many interests around the world. And I want to put it uh, quite simply, the leverage ratio here in China compared with the major economies in the world is in the medium level. It's not like the exaggeration by the, some media. This is one part of the answer. And the second, when it comes to the debt of China or the leverage ratio, it's all controllable because it is still at the medium level. So thus, it is controllable and manageable. It's not like uh, uh, some media claimed. Now, it is uh, quite significant for us to deal with this issue. And thirdly, the government is considering to reduce the corporate leverage ratio prudently and proactively. I think you can uh, find more information, um, keep track of us. In maybe in the future, in the near future, there will be policies and measures coming up regarding the uh, prudent deleveraging for the corporates. OK? So our, uh, one of the gentlemen with uh, glasses sitting in the middle. Thank you, moderator. I'm from Tencent uh, Finance. I'm from media. And also, I have a question for Mr. Xu. Uh, after the Brexit, Brexit uh, in the UK, and uh, when it up comes, uh, whether it will have the impact for those uh, companies invested in the UK in from China, especially for the companies coming to the UK for mergers and acquisitions. So uh, they need to get through from the NDRCs to get approval. What, what's your suggestions for, for them to engage in the mergers and acquisitions? OK, so this is the hottest issue in the recent few days. Before the referendum, People um, make the judgment it is possible for, it is not possible for the UK to exit from the European Union. Well, we ended up with such a kind of outcome. I think this is the internal affairs of the UK or even of uh, the European Union. So it is our position and attitude to, re to respect the choices of uh, the UK people, but we also expect a prosperous uh, European Union and China with the European Union and with the United Kingdom have uh, good foundations for the practical uh, and the pragmatic cooperation. In our One Belt, One Road initiative, we are trying to be aligned with the investment plan of uh, European Union proposed by Juncker, the president of uh, the uh, European Union. Um, just as this gentleman have mentioned, uh, we also have some pragmatic cooperation with the United Kingdom. And we will continue this momentum with the European Union, with the United Kingdom. But one thing that we cannot deny after the Brexit, the uncertainties and volatilities for the world economy has been enhanced. As we all see in recent few days, uh, how the stock market uh, glo globally performed. There is a great turbulence in the foreign exchange market as well. For the Chinese companies coming to the UK to do business, to do mergers and acquisitions, maybe the businessman can make a wiser decision than I do. They will be very prudent to uh, make observations. Given the current context, there will be uh, the reduction of the capital asset uh, asset prices, the weak uh, foreign exchanges, and when you want to make an investment, the the assets uh, will have their price reduced, and also for the foreign exchange, there will be more risks. I believe that the businessmen are smart enough to deal with this issue properly. Thank you. So I have a follow up question. So once uh, the practices uh, trigger the turbulence around the world that is going ex beyond our expectations. Uh, so NDRC, do you have any countermeasures? 
So, I, as I have talked about uh, the uh, Chinese economy uh, as the integral part of the global economy, the Brexit. Uh, as a global event, definitely has impact on Chinese economy. As I said, through the investment, through trading, through the capital flow, it may impact the Chinese economy. Just as I believe it, the impact on Chinese economy is not as big as we imagine, and uh, the certain uh, government authorities also have our own plan B as a countermeasures to deal with the Brexit. OK, the next question, please. I'm Zhao Lijun from Boatian Environment. I also have a question for Mr. Xu. So by May, the social investment has reduced by 3.9%. I know the government is trying to take measures against that. So actually, uh, there are a lot of uh, government grants and the government funds have a flow to the government platform and to the state-owned enterprises that kind of squeeze out those private companies. So I want to know, do you have any countermeasures to improve this kind of situation? So the uh, fixed asset investment around the China is a very big economic indicators, and it plays its role for our assessment for economic growth. So the current rate for the fixed asset investment increased by 9.6%. Uh, the question you have raised is concerning the private sector investments. So there is a further reduction on this re regard. It has re reduced by 3.9%. So it has attracted the wide attention now because the private uh, private sector investment uh, account for 64.2 percent for the inbound and 67 percent for the outbound investment. So for this kind of situation, there are a lot of reasons to explain it. We consider the first is from the market. The, as the economy slows down, the demand is getting sluggish. Of course, the investment will be impacted. So this is one reason. Secondly, secondly about the policy implementation. Starting from 2005, uh, the government have drawn up a uh, 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 guidance paper for the development of private sector. And in 2012, there is another paper for supporting uh, the private sector and also uh, the social investment also from the private sector. And this has become a very popular uh, policies. But once those policies become to be implemented, the situation has been changed. It is another case. Some policies haven't been landed at all. So the third is the reasons from uh, from the corporate, corporates themselves. So currently, the demand is sluggish in the market. So where should they put the money? In the traditional industry? Of course not. For the emerging industry, they need uh, the technical preparations. They need uh, the management team and also the market and marketing. It can not be achieved uh, by one stroke. It takes time. So for all those elements put together, we ended up with the reduced private sec uh, private investment. For this, the um, city council have uh, organized nine expert teams uh, representing different ministries uh, to go to the field to do the survey. and. Uh, NDRC also have its teams um, to do uh, this uh, field uh, field investigation. And later on, there will be the results of the investigation coming out. And according to the results, the city council will come up with its own measures to support and further stimulate the private uh, investment. Due to the time limit, I cannot accept more questions. I, I believe it, the, this question all targeting at uh, Mr. Xu. And I want to engage more uh, panelists uh, as 
on the 10th year for our summer Davos. For the future, what's the highlight? Is that uh, any risks or any new concepts or anything uncertain? So just to point out one highlight. So who is ready, then you can just go, go ahead. So I'll be the first. I believe that in the future, I think that the globalization of the uh, Chinese ent enterprises. I think that the most important is that is to uh, foster the new drivers and the new innovation, and we need to be confident in Chinese economy. If you want to transform as a company and also China, you need to collaborate and to listen and to learn from others. So better say it in Chinese. If I translate it well. Can you, can you repeat again? It's important so as uh, three of us uh, work, uh, work together, uh, one of them could be my tutor. So I want to emphasize is that um, we need to have the complementary uh, measures. Probably not so much an, an issue for China, but uh, in the rest of the world, as we see the evolving uh, nature of terrorism mm. and, and public safety, I think there is a real debate that we have to have around public safety versus uh, privacy and people's right to their own information. Okay, wonderful. Thank you very much for our panelists for this very exciting and insightful session. And thank you also to our audience for your patience and your good questions. Thank you. Bye-bye.